I'm Scott Allen Miller. It is the 26th of May, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. And today we're going to be doing a show about budgets and what it takes to live in Nicaragua. Specifically, how much is it going to cost you to live in Nicaragua? We're going to get to that right after the bump. Alright, so we're going to be answering the question, great program, we, we actually had this in yesterday's video, but I want to expand on it from Steve Jefferson. If I live in Nicaragua for good, how much money will I need monthly? How much is an affordable house? And so forth. So let's talk about building a budget here in Nicaragua, because normally when we're talking about budgets, we tend to do something along the lines of saying, if I had this much money, how could I live? And that's really useful. And you should watch some of those videos and give them some likes and share them with friends and all that stuff, because it helps build the channel. But Let's try taking a completely different approach today and let's look at how much it's actually going to cost you. And it's super warm as I'm doing this. I've got to do it in my office because it's a good one because I'm kind of like working with numbers. But it's uh, it's really warm because it's been drizzling all day and there's no breeze and I had to turn the fans off, but it's cool enough I don't have the AC on, but with the lights and the hat, and the it's warm. Uh, but we're going to be looking at what is your basic range of cost of things. So. Let's start talking housing. That is your, your big single item that everyone's gonna talk about. How much is it gonna cost you to live? So I mentioned this yesterday. On the low end of reasonable, of houses we have found, the cheapest is about $150. And most people are gonna be looking at $200 or up. Remember, we're talking about expats coming to Nicaragua. We're talking about people who have options, but are probably looking to not go crazy just due to, due to the nature of the people watching my channel. If you want super expensive housing, of course it exists. You can go crazy luxury, all of that. You can go super huge, anything you can imagine. It's available here. And if it isn't readily available, you can build it, right? So, so we're not going to worry about what the top end could look like. Just assume you can spend as much money as you like. Same as anywhere else. You can have a castle from Europe picked up flown in piece by piece by helicopter across the Atlantic and reassembled here if that's what you so desire and it will cost as much as you want to spend. Okay, from a normal housing perspective, we're going to say on the low end, 150. Reasonable low is about 2, 250. And on the high end is about 550. This is about what you're going to spend for a house. I do know people who've gone to spend, who have spent more, right? Getting into the 600s, getting into the 700s, even the 800s. We're talking extremely large houses, lots of bedrooms, very desirable areas, specialty homes, uh, giant pools, things like that. They exist, right? So, so be aware you're like absolute high end is going to be around a thousand outside of enclaves, right? So this is where it shocks people because if they talk to realtors and they're looking at enclave living, you're looking at San Juan del Sur, you're looking at Iguana, these really specialty resort areas that are very far out, uh, that are completely enclosed, that speak English, that have all kinds of built-in amenities and everything. They're often talking thousands of dollars a month, right? 1,200 to, to three to $4,000 a month. These are big budgets and they sound cheap compared to something similar in the United States. So people say, oh, that's that's a good deal. I want to move to Nicaragua. And they don't realize that they're paying outrageously outside the bounds of what Nicaraguan pricing is. They're also getting a style of house that doesn't exist in Nicaragua. So it's all about balance and understanding what you're looking at and what you're looking for. But if you're watching my channel, there's a really good chance that you are falling into the, I want a reasonable place. I want to live at least somewhat like a Nicaraguan. I want to have some kind of budget uh, and I'm not looking for super outrageous places. Those types of places, part of the reason that it's not worth spending a lot of time talking about them on this channel. And of course, I'd like to visit them and show them to you guys as well. And we did, we poked into Valero the other day. Uh, but in looking at this, Right, those places are all sold by big companies and their price is their price. You can look it up remotely, decide if you want a specific one, pick out your layout, pay for it and everything remotely. You don't need to, you know, nothing I say is going to change that price. Those prices are not based on the Nicaraguan market. They are based on what they can convince someone to buy remotely without investigating the Nicaraguan market or regardless of the Nicaraguan market, either way. 
What we're talking about is what actual houses that Nicaraguans might live in would cost. And $150 will get you a quite livable house that will function like a small apartment, but be very comfortable. Uh, and $550 will get you a really large place with lots of space, potentially a swimming pool, plenty of rooms. And if you need something absolutely crazy, of course, you can go as high as you want. The sky is the limit. That is your single largest budget item. And I think the majority of people are going to be between $200, most likely $250, and about 450. That's kind of your sweet spot where you're getting a really nice home here in Nicaragua at a really affordable price. If you get too expensive, you start losing the benefits of being in a low cost country. If you get too cheap, you're simply not taking advantage of the possibility of having a really nice house. Uh, now, food. This is going to be your single largest expense, but it's not a single line item because you're going to spend it all over the place. So the question is going to come down to groceries and so forth. On the absolute cheapest end, I assume you could eat, feed yourself if you're being dangerously budget conscious at around $3 per day or $90 per month. That's going to be very hard to do, but it is possible. Um, much more likely, you're going to want to spend above $10 per day. At $10 per day, you have the ability to go out to eat, to cook for yourself, and basically don't have to worry about things. You're not going to be going out for steak dinners. You're not going to be going out for fancy things. You're not going to be going out for salmon. But you are going to be able to eat and eat pretty well and probably have three meals. Uh, you won't have a lot of fancy meals, but you will be able to go out to restaurants. Not the fanciest restaurants, but good restaurants you're going to have options. So, uh, and this is per person, of course, for food. Um, so at $10 or $300, $320 a month, I think you're looking at a reasonable budget for food if you wanna be budget conscious. And if you don't need to be super budget conscious, somewhere in the $1,000 per month range gets you into a very comfortable eating scenario where yes, you're not going out for every meal. Yes, you're not splurging on, on steak every time, but you could have a steak once in a while. You can have salmon once in a while. You can go out to eat at a nice restaurant multiple times per week. You don't have to cook at home all the time. And when you do cook at home, you have a lot more options. You can get more brand names and stuff. Uh, if you want to get to about, I said this in the last video, the upper end is somewhere around $3,000 a month or $100 per day really gets into you the, I don't know how anyone could spend that much on food per day living in Nicaragua. I'm sure someone will send me an example of where they could go eat for, for $100 a day um, and not be sick and be able to be like, can you do it once or can you do it day after day, right? That would be a question. Um, of course, if you're going to try to uh, have something like uh, exotic food that's been flown in that you would never normally get, uh, you want to eat nothing but sushi at the most expensive places, you need um, you know large bottles of, of imported champagne and that kind of stuff, yes, there's ways to pad to get to $100 if that's what your goal is. Um, but realistically, you're not going to just go up to $100 possibly ever. I have never, right? I've never come close, never probably crossed the halfway point to that ever in my years here, and I'm willing to go out to some pretty nice places. There are places that will get more expensive than where I've been, but very few. So so our, our lowest, we're going to say $300 per month, and we're going to put the upper bounds for food at about $1,200 per month, um, and that gives you a pretty good spending range. Again, you can go higher, but we're assuming if you're making a budget, you are attempting to watch your budget to some degree. Right. These are the ranges for people who are budgeting. If you have, you know, ten thousand dollars per month to spend in general, you're going to go for amazing housing. You're going to eat like crazy. You're going to have excess money. You're not going to know what to do with yourself. Um, you may get a second house. You may get an apartment in a different region. Certainly, my own goal. Uh, once I'm to a point where paying for this house is is a non thing, and I don't care about the money, and I have an excess amount of money, I would like a city at a, a city apartment. Right, that's a very reasonable thing if I'm going to get a second place, a place that is completely different. And I don't mean this city, I mean a different city, right? That I can go to a city with high rises and live in a completely different thing, have an apartment there. That's how I would expand my budget if I was going past the kind of things we're talking about here. Everyone's different, but that's where I would go. So that's food. Now, power or electric. This is going to be... The cheapest I've heard from anyone is $17 for expats living with appliances and computers and things like that. That's not really reasonable that you're going to recreate that on a regular basis. So we're going to say a low end budget of $50 a month. And we're going to say a top end, this is the highest I've ever seen, is 400 
going with the highest I've ever seen because I've seen it in real life, I want to use it. Um, could you use more power than this? Of course, you have expats who are potentially going to get large houses, install air conditioning and run them like crazy without any regard for keeping the place like too colder than it should be, uh, that it's not well sealed, that they're using power like wild. Um, that kind of stuff will happen. So the possibility that you're going to have a completely exploding power budget, it could happen, right? Um, when I lived in Texas, I tell the story all the time. When I lived in Texas, we averaged between two and 400 per month with the highest we ever hit with roommates who weren't really good at understanding how air conditioning worked, hitting over $800 a month. I've never seen stuff like that here, even though it's hotter and you need air conditioning more and you have more units and it's just, but in theory, if those same people lived here and worked the same way, it's probably going to hit 800 too, because they're going to be doing similar things. So, uh, if you're willing to put in the effort to think about how power works and be somewhat conscious about it, then it's going to be, you know, on the low end. Here in the, we have a giant estate, lots of people doing things all the time, running computers all the time, and we're below $100 basically all of the time. So that should give you some idea of what it can be like, but be aware there's plenty of situations where people are going to steal your power and you're not going to catch it right away. Um, you're going to have a device that's that's not working the way that it should and you don't catch it right away and you may rack up your power a little bit. Be aware of your power usage, put effort into that and you're going to make it really cheap. Next up, what am I going to spend on water? Well, water and sewer generally are combined and often combined with your uh, waste pickup. Now, not always. So I'll break that out, but I don't know the water bills nearly as well. And these, I assume, vary pretty wildly across the country. Uh, but I figure normally you're going to spend somewhere in the $20 to $100 per month range. And I'd love to hear from some of you, uh, definitely on all this stuff. All of you that live here or spend a bit of time here, let me know about some of these bills um, in real world. I expect them to be falling into these ranges, but I want to see where they, they fall in the real world. And we can talk about those specific examples potentially. Uh, but in many cases, water and trash and sewer are all going to be mixed together and not that expensive. Water here tends to be pretty cheap, um, and trash pickup tends to be really cheap. The city tends to do it. Here where I live in the country, the city does not do it. We have a private citizen who comes around with a horse and a cart, and he picks it up, and the prices have gone up. It's now $3, not quite, but it's a pretty close to $3 per pickup, which he does a few times a week. So we're spending somewhere between six and $9 per week for him to pick up trash. So that's, for us, pretty expensive, but we're also pretty far out of the way. He's making a special trip, and everyone complains about how expensive it is. So that is that is our trash situation, but we're helping take care of a guy and his horse. We're not so concerned. Um, but that's that's kind of where that sits, and trash pickup is normally handled by the city. Uh, if you live far enough out in the country, often you just burn it. Heck, I'm from the U.S., that's what we did growing up, so not uh, not that weird. Transportation is going to be your next big expense, and that one is pretty tough because if you don't go anywhere, this could be zero, right? If you want to travel places all the time, this could be really high. If you want to own a nice car, a Toyota Hilux, a Land Cruiser, a Prado, and you want to have it be brand new, you want it to be maintained and clean, and you want to drive all over the place all the time, you could have a pretty big travel budget. But if you just want to take uh, public transportation when necessary, and most of the time you're staying home, you want to use a bicycle, you might walk, you could get a transportation budget that literally approaches nothing at all. Um, and you may want to may say $2 per day tops. And that's a lot. At $2 per day, most locals will not spend that, not even close. So uh, be aware that you could potentially be super, super low. And if you like live on the beach, and I'll just use Las Panitas as an example, or Pona Loya, they don't have grocery stores there, but there is a way to buy anything you need to survive. Rice, beans, fruits, vegetables, some meat, uh, cooking supplies, and so forth. Once you have your house basically set up, you don't ever have to go anywhere if you don't want to. Even if you want to go to restaurants, it's all within walking distance. If you want to go hang out on the beach or go to a dance club, all within walking distance. So it is not unreasonable to live on the beach and basically never have to pay for transportation. And if you do come into the city, it is about 50 cents or less. Maybe it's 15 cents, whatever it is. It's ridiculously cheap on the bus. It doesn't take a long time. It's very easy and it drops you off in a place where you can go do more shopping, get your stuff, get back on the bus and come back again. So your budget for transportation, even if you live in some place like a beach, could be really, really low 
all depends how much you want to do. Gas here is going to cost more than it does in the US, but long distance drives tend to be done pretty slowly in really fuel efficient vehicles. And the fuel, while it's more expensive, is also a higher octane. So we're actually getting more mileage from the same fuel, even under the same conditions. So that's something to get used to that it's just gonna, it skews the numbers. It's not that it's better or worse in the grand scheme of things. It is simply that it makes it seem like you pay extra per gallon, but it also seems like you get better gas mileage. In reality, it's just playing with the numbers by moving where the octane and cost and scale of the fuel is. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier to store, I believe. So that, just be aware that cars probably cost more per mile, but the number of miles you will go is probably pretty low. Because even driving to Managua for us, which is really far and takes you know it's a big thing it's like oh 50 miles away that's not that far right like it's it's a completely different thing but we're driving there really slowly so we tend to go small distances at slow speeds which gives us better gas mileage but more time is used but less fuel is expended by quite a bit um, so those are just things to get used to but if you're going to use public transportation you can get down to incredibly cheap even with going all across the country, as long as you're willing to spend time on a bus. So some of this will come down to, do you need to work and you've got to do things quickly because you got to get back to the office? You're going to have a much bigger transportation budget. Or are you uh, retired or just looking to do something super leisurely and you don't care how long it takes and it, it's all about saving the money, then you can do things so cheaply, even getting into other countries can be ridiculously cheap. So just consider that those options do exist. So we're going to put transportation at this is a tough one to call we're going to put it at 15 a month going up to what's a good number considering you might have a car and car payments and all that stuff without getting ridiculous we're going to put the top end at a thousand a month that's assuming you're buying a vehicle maintaining it and driving a bit if you're going to get a land cruiser you're going to go crazy and be like look i'm on safari but it's nicaragua okay you could spend more but these are we're trying to get reasonable ranges for people who might have a budget um, but $15 a month would be really tough to, to really beat because uh, you're going to want to take a taxi once in a while. You're going to want to take a uh, public transportation somewhere once in a while. But if you can really do everything on bicycle, of course, you know you better than, than I do. I don't even know you. So <laughs> any of you living in my little box. Um, so those are those are the really big items. Now for entertainment, there's no way to put a number on this. We talked about this in the video yesterday that, that entertainment tends to be incredibly cheap. So for most of us, we're only spending a few dollars per month specifically on, our, on entertainment. Now, if you want to put an alcohol budget into that, that makes more sense. And so that's really where you want to be. Now, you may say, I don't drink. Okay, if you don't drink, then you're probably going to want an entertainment budget. If you do drink, you may not have an entertainment budget because your drinking may provide the entertainment. Not that alcohol itself is entertainment, but because you often get free shows when you're buying alcohol, whether it's watching sports at a sports bar with people, whether it's live music, karaoke, uh, uh, dancing, whatever. Uh, those things are often ridiculously cheap or free and they just expect you to buy some alcohol or get your food there. There's ways to even be cheaper. I'm just gonna get a soda. I'm just gonna get french fries. I'm just going to have one drink and, and whatever. There's ways to get it super cheap, but we're not trying to come up with the ultimate low budget here. We're trying to come up with what does it cost to live in Nicaragua for normal people. And uh, for that, I'm going to say an alcohol budget of a minimum of $10 per week, which is $40 a month. And I know that sounds crazy. For some of you, it sounds crazy cheap because you're like, that's like, what, two drinks in a month? And for others, you're like, $40, that's like 40 beers a month. Who's drinking that much? I'm trying to give you something reasonable in the middle, but it is worth noting when you move to the tropics, almost everyone, except for those who don't drink at all, drinks a lot more. It's going to happen to you. If you drink one drink a day now, expect you're going to drink two in the future. If you drink one a week now, expect three or four a week in the future. When you move to Nicaragua, it's just how things are going to work, partially because your drinks are so much cheaper, partially because it's what everyone does, partially because it's part of the entertainment, and partially because for some reason the tropics makes people drink. So on the low end, $40. On the high end, again, I'm going to throw $1,000 on this, and you're going to say, wait, what now? Um, but if you're really spending, there's a good chance you're going to be buying for other people, and at you know $1,000 when you break it down by day is only about $35 a day. And if you're buying a number of, you know, you're going for cocktails, you're getting pina coladas or whatever, you could be spending three to $4 per drink. If you're buying them for other people, that can add up pretty quickly and spending $12 a day, uh, I'm sorry, $35 a day 
while a lot is not completely outrageous. And if you're throwing things like house parties, which people might do, you could easily、uh, spend quite a bit—100,、um, $200—to have drinks for lots of friends. You only have to do that a few times a month to add up to your thousand. It does not necessarily mean that you have to be an alcoholic to be spending that much, because often in that entertainment alcohol budget, you're spending on other people. But if you're only looking at drinks for you and much more normal, then forty dollars a month to maybe a hundred dollars a month is a much much more reasonable range.、Uh, but you probably will buy more beers or more seltzers than you expect that you will,、uh, and partially because it's, it's warm. You like to drink things. That's what you do. You're gonna buy fewer desserts and you're gonna buy more drinks.、Um, so I highly recommend. Uh, light beers and seltzers because they are lower in calories and will affect your life less and give you more water to drink while you're drinking because you simply need to take more in. Also, get more ice water just as a general rule. All right, so there's always some utility items. You're probably going to want Wi-Fi at home, internet access. Looking at places like Claro and Tigo, you're looking at budgets of about thirty-nine dollars for the services that most people are going to want. If you're in Managua, I've seen it for thirty-four, but that's about as cheap as you're reasonably going to go on the high end. About the highest that anyone would reasonably need to go, about eighty, maybe ninety dollars a month for high-end fiber services that are symmetric. If you're like me. And you're doing an outrageous amount of work. You have multiple people, and you you really are dependent on your internet, and you just have a lot of things going on. We keep I've said this a lot of times. We keep Teco and Claro, and our phones are Tigo. So we have three separate services. We don't count the Tigo because it's our cell phones, but we have three different、uh, carriers all together. Should the internet ever go out, not because it goes out very often. It's actually very very stable, but. We are so dependent on it, and so far from family, and have so few options to get to other regions with different carriers that we decide that this is a priority for us. But we also have lots of people in the house: five people who live here absolutely full time,、uh, another couple who live here effectively full time, and many who pass in and out. Many of whom you see on the show from time to time.、Uh, so we, on an average day, have six to eight people living in the house. So the fact that we have Teco, which is the $80 service for high-speed fiber symmetric, and we keep Claro at somewhere around $39 per month. Of, I'm not sure if we're on that one or a slight $49, somewhere in there. We have a total budget of about $130, but we're talking per person when we're talking this budget. So if you're looking at $40 per person for a basic Claro, us paying $180 for eight people on an average day is about. A little bit over half the cost、uh, per person that you'd be looking at with that. So it's not as outrageous as it sounds. It is also that all of us work from here. So this is all of our offices, all of our home, mo- mo- multiple people, people coming and going, lots of parties. We have a lot of stuff like that going on. So it makes sense. It is not the crazy thing that it might seem like、uh, that we are doing. But th- those are numbers to work with. I don't know anyone who needs to spend above like the eighty, ninety dollars that we are with Teco. That is an extremely good service, really high speed,、uh, and you don't need the kind of numbers that people talk about in the U.S.、Um, not because you're not in the U.S., because you didn't need them in the U.S. either. That is just a marketing tactic, and you do not need the kind of numbers that they say. We can do an entire video sometime if people got questions. You know, obviously get down there below、um, about how internet works and how to measure it and how to determine what you need and what makes sense and what. What is actually useful versus marketing? That's a separate thing. But what we're getting here is really good speeds at really good prices and very good support and everything.、Um, and so,、uh, at at paying for two services and having that peace of mind, and I use both at the same time. I work on Teco. Like I'm sitting at my computer right now working on Teco, but I also have my GoPros plugged in and uploading currently on Claro. So I'm maxing out the Claro, and sometimes it'll run all night as I get videos uploaded for you guys. But it's not impacting our other services because it's on a separate network,、uh, and I don't have to worry about it. So I just plug in and go. I don't have to worry that I'm using excess bandwidth. And when we have an outage, on the rare occasion that that happens, we have both Wi-Fi networks that we can switch between, and we're using completely different services, fiber and cable. It's not even the same type of service. And then I've got Tigo on here. So on the extreme case where I've lost fiber and、uh, cable at the same time. Hop on the Wi-Fi and or not on the Wi-Fi. Hop on the the LTE, and we can get at least reasonable speeds. We can still do uploads. We can still get the word out about what's going on.、Uh, let people know where we are and so forth. So now the next question is, how much are you going to pay for your service on this? This is my QR code for this show. You're already watching it. You don't need to see it. I pay.、Uh, I do 15 days at a time prepay. I love doing that service. It is the easiest thing in the world to to use. I'm on Tigo, but Claro works too. 
and that is uh, 200 Cordoba. When I do that, it's 36 Cordoba to the dollar, so you can figure that out, but it's round about $6, and I do it twice a month. So about $12 per month is $3 for the initial SIM card. Disregard that one, three, one time $3 fee. It is $12 a month to have a ton of service on my phone. That's unlimited WhatsApp, basically unlimited uh, YouTube, uh, unlimited Facebook and Instagram, and a lot of the things that TikTok, the things that you will normally use all the time, they're unlimited. And then you have a certain amount of data, quite a bit, to use for email and other things that you may need. I've never come close to that limit, but it's there if I need it. Um, and, and you can make calls and do all that. So you do want a cell phone, but you can buy cell phones here, new from good carriers for, not carriers, from good phone makers, just over $100 at like the Mi store in the mall. That's Xiaomi phones for 100 bucks. That's crazy good. Uh, $3 to get into a SIM card, do a prepay plan, and only six uh, $6 per 15 days or $12 per month is amazing. And honestly, our service is better than anything we've seen in the US, but we don't have some of the international stuff. So uh, you can do what's called postpay, where you have an account and they charge you at the end of the month. I don't think it's worth it for most people, but if that's what you want to do, those options exist too, and they can be fine. So plan for, we'll just go, we'll just say high end $15 for phone service per month, but I don't actually any, know anyone that needs to spend that much. Uh, and, and there are ways to be cheaper, but obviously very little uh, bit cheaper. Um, with those, then you need to simply plan on what is your shopping budget? How much do you want to spend on clothing? How much do you want to spend on computers? How much do you want to spend on uh, video games? Just whatever, all your, your other shopping. That's something I really can't give you much of an insight into because everyone is so different. Um, you just need to to really sit down and think, what what do I need to do? How often do I want to shop? How much do I want to set aside for that? And that's going to give you your budget for things. And uh, pretty much, that's what you need to worry about. Now, as an expat, you're going to have a little bit of expenses, like you need to plan for uh, you know $10 a month or whatever for uh, visa renewals and things like that. There's going to be a little bit of inc uh, uh, incidental costs that come up. Of course, if you're looking at uh, residency, you're going to need to pay for, most likely, a lawyer, possibly investing in a business. There's lots of things that could could exist, but if you're coming in as just a tourist, you don't have any of those costs, and you're just looking at what does the monthly cost work out to be, this is kind of the range. And you can add these together, and you can see that on the low end, you could certainly live here for under $1,000 a month, and on the high end, it's not impossible to be spending over $4,000 a month, and that's kind of the, the big range, but you have to play with each one of those sliders and see, well, yeah, I'm not going to spend a ton on housing, and I'm certainly not going to spend a ton on a car, but I might party a lot, and so, you know, see what your budget might realistically be. For a family of five here, uh, you know, we're realistically spending um, in, in excess of $5,000 per month, but we have a lot of expenses. We have things that are not being added on here, and so we're going to talk about those in just a second because um, that, in to that total expansive budget, there's a lot of things that can happen to you in Nicaragua. But I want to stop at this first point and say, here's the budget for the things you normally consider. These are the things that you think of as your budget for, say, replicating your life in another country. All right, our second category of things is the expenses and budget that you need to consider that you would never have considered before, probably. So that is, when you get to Nicaragua, you're probably going to want staff. Not that you have no staff in the United States, you probably have someone who mows your lawn or does something for you. Here in Nicaragua, you're likely to have that too, but uh, some of those things are going to be the same. Do you need an exterminator service? Yes. When we lived in Texas, we had an exterminator. Premier in Dallas, they're awesome. Use them. Um, but if you're here, do you need one? Yeah, same thing. It's going to be cheaper here, but the basics are the same. And I don't know the budget for the, the exterminator, so I'm sorry that I don't have a number for that. However, what I do want to talk about is uh, you're likely to want some staff around your house. Now, the size of your house and the number of people you're talking about bringing will change this number dramatically. If you want to live in a tiny place, you're on your own, you have a very tight budget, you could easily go without any of these services. And don't worry about it. You can take it, you know, especially if you're retired, you want to do your own gardening, cleaning around your own house. You're not making a big mess. It's a small place. Whatevs, you're good to go. But what if you're working from home and you want some things to be taken care of for you? What if you don't want to go out traveling? You're a little bit nervous of going to the market alone. You want to get lower costs on food. Think about some of those things. What can you do? So services that we use and a lot of people have in some degree include a maid service, uh, not service, but a person who's doing, working as a maid, a person who's working as a cook, a person who's working as a handyman, gardener, 
security. It's five basic roles. And of course, you can come up with others. But those are the main ones. And how much does a person cost? It's going to vary some by a lot of things. I'm going to distill this a little bit. But typically, a person who's going to be working in your house is going to cost somewhere in the range of $250 a month. That is a monthly cost. That is not how you pay them. I'm not going to get into the intricacies of how you pay and all those things. But assume a person who's going to be getting vacation and stuff. In many cases, they may live in your house with you. Um, they're going to be around about $250 of expense to pay them per month. Assume at least an additional maybe $50 for feeding them and other things they may need to do the job. So let's just put that number at $300 per person. Um, and then you can kind of decide from there what makes sense for you. Typically, that's a full-time person, right? And in many cases, full-time means six days a week, but assume just eight hours a day. They're going to take lunch, whatever. We're not talking about working anyone into the ground, but it is standard to work a six-day week, but you do give holidays and normal vacations and that kind of stuff. And if you don't do those things, you have to pay them out and they will get a lot more expensive. Let's face it, you don't need people to be working holidays for you. Just let them have their days off. All right, so figure $300 per person. That will vary, right? A maid is going to be cheaper. A handyman is going to be more expensive, whatever. A night guard is going to be more than a day guard, perhaps, but there's a lot of ways to negotiate, right? It depends on the situation. If you want someone with a gun, it's going to be a lot more expensive, but you don't need that under any normal circumstances. Some places do. Normally, they're businesses, right? or really large complexes with lots of, of well-to-do people, one guard that they all share kind of thing. Uh, so do you want to cook? A cook is a really good position because they can do shopping for you, they can prepare menus, they can do a lot of things if you're working, if you have a family, to keep things moving in a cost-effective way without you having to become overly involved. This can save a ton of your time and potentially save money on the cost of cooking. Uh, I'm sorry, on the cost of the the food to cook, the actual shopping cost, uh, because they know how to shop and do that stuff. So that can offset its cost really well. Uh, made, obviously, very handy. Uh, keeping the house clean, it's just, it's time that you don't have to spend. And this is the tropics. So we tend to live with our windows open, our doors open. There is dust. There are animals. Uh, there's just a lot going on. It makes sense to clean more than you're used to. We also have tile floors and stuff. So cleaning is much easier than you're probably used to. But there tends to be a lot of cleaning to do, and of course they will do laundry and put away groceries and organize things and, and all that. Um, there's a lot, especially if you have a smaller place, there's a lot you can have them do and you can mix these roles, but a maid is very often something that makes sense. A handyman, generally you're just going to want someone on call, you're not going to want to have a full-time person, but it depends on the size of your estate, how much you want to do, uh, what what kind of stuff they're, they're going to be doing. Gardening, we have a lot of gardens here. Uh, generally, you're not going to need very much, but we need a lot. So we have a crew of four or five people who come in every week, and we spend $50 a week. So it's $200 a month. It's not a staffer who actually works for us and is here all the time. It is a service, um, and we get a whole crew, and they get brought in, and then a guy comes and collects the money later. Like There's a whole mechanism for it, but it's quite good. And at $200 a month, it's excellent. If we had a full-time gardener, yeah, he might be able to do a little bit more for sure, but he's not going to be able to do a lot more because it's a crew of like four people for a full day. So that's like four days of a gardener's time. And that gardener is not going to cost 200 a month. It's going to cost closer to 300 because you're going to have him here six days a week and you got to feed him and all that kind of stuff. So now feeding people does get cheaper because if you have a cook and they're cooking for all the staff, they tend to cook one meal that they all share, like not a single meal, but a single meal item right? It's going to be grilled chicken and rice and yuca, right? Well, they're going to make a big thing of yuca, a big thing of rice, and a bunch of, of grilled chicken all at once, and everybody's going to have it, and that becomes a little bit more cost-effective. So there's ways that that gets pretty pretty good. Um, but a full-time gardener would be beneficial from a, well, they water the plants every day. They're keeping an eye on everything that happens. They're always watching the garden. Sure, if you want to do that, absolutely. It's going to be more expensive. If you want to have a garden crew like we do, they get at least 90% of what a gardener would do, but at only two-thirds the price. Uh, and there's a whole mechanism behind it, and, and we can only use them when we need them and whatever. So there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, handyman, like we have here, an older house, there's often roof work to be done, electrical work to be done, things we want to change. Hang a TV here, move this thing there maybe drive and run errands. Having a handyman or someone who functions at that can be beneficial. It's And then security. Generally, you don't want security during the day. If you're in a gated community, you're probably getting that as part of the community. If you have a private place and you want to have your own security guard, typically it's just one and just at night because during the day, they're there sleeping or you're awake or something. Um, but around about the same price because they generally don't have a lot to do. 
course, you can combine a lot of these things. Do you have a need for security, but they have nothing to do and not a big space? Maybe they're going to do some maintenance work at night if you don't mind the noise. Uh, do you have a person who cooks and is a maid because they can do that and it's a smaller house? Of course, that works really well. All these things you can mix and match together depending on how much of each need you have. For us, we have a lot of people who like to eat a lot of different things because everyone's pretty picky uh, and we're vegetarian and everyone has like really strong dietary needs. Uh, my wife has really strong issues with onions. My daughter is lactose intolerant. My other daughter does not like certain foods, um, but is, she's at that age where her tastes are changing. So it's like a constant struggle to keep up. And so cooking is a big challenge. We don't eat the same things. We could but it would be a lot more work and people would be very unhappy. So having a cook who makes anything we want any time of the day and does the shopping and when she's not busy cooking, she fills in to help with the cleaning is amazing. We then have a halftime made three days a week, three full days, and with the, the chef supplementing on the other days, just a little bit, right? Just putting some things away, uh, sweeping here and there. She doesn't do a ton, but she does help keep things clean. She does all the dishes. You could have a maid who does the dishes if your cook was really busy. Uh, so those two positions for us offset a lot. Uh, we then have a full-time guard, um, we have a part-time handyman, and we hire in the gardening crew. That is how we handle it. Um, but for everyone, it's their own thing. But really, just budgeting about $300 per position like that will work out at least pretty well for providing yourself a budget. It may not give you an exact, this is what I should spend guideline, but it does give you an idea of what should you prepare to spend over a number of people. And I know it's going to be a little bit hard for you to visualize because the idea that you may have staff for things is probably pretty foreign. And you're going to be like, I, what am I going to do now? I don't think I'm going to do that. And then when you get here after a while, you'll be like, of course I'm going to do that. That's why I moved here. Um, it's easy to end up with a lot of staff. And if you're like us, we have so much staff that we also also have a major domo who oversees the staff. She will also supplement once in a while. She will cook once in a while. She will clean once in a while. She will hang uh, the, the, the quilts behind me. Uh, so sometimes she'll do the shopping. She'll fill in where it's needed. If we have someone who doesn't know what they should be doing or how to budget or how to figure out the menu for the week, she will jump in and do those things. Uh, so she runs the house and runs the expenses and oversees all of that. So we roughly have a crew of six, if that's how you want to look at it. Um, and that is a really big budgetary item. Um, so when we're talking about having a household budget pushing $4,000 a month, it's because we have a very large staff as a part of that, or I'm sorry, more like $5,000 a month. We have a very large staff that is a part of that um, and makes for the ability for all of us to be able to work. It allows us to uh, go places and know that the kids have a cook who's cooking for them, security who's watching over them, always someone that they can go to for something all the time, um, that the dogs are never alone no, if they need to be fed, if they need to be walked, if we need something checked, if we need a door locked, unlocked, whatever. We have people for all those different things and we don't have to worry about it and that gives us a lot of peace of mind but we also are a lot of people running businesses from this house and that makes it make a lot more sense that probably for most of you it's not going to but it's something you need to consider because it might make sense for you and if you're not budgeting for it you're not going to know and you may think well that's for people who are really spending their money i'm like does that really go with the budget thing and I think you'll find that it probably does. If you're on your most austere budget possible, if you're on an actual austerity budget, then no, you're not going to be hiring staff, except maybe, maybe a single person who's going to do a little bit of everything, most importantly the shopping, so that there's a lot of things that you may get wrong, they will take care of them. For example, we have our staff order and pay for our water delivery, our groceries, our internet, our all the bills, all the things that need to get paid. They take the transportation into the city and they do that. They run and stand in line at the bank and they run and do all those different things that are incredibly time consuming and could make it difficult to work. For us, the most important thing is it allows our company to be much more effective because the staff is allowing us to keep working in the United States by having things in Nicaragua taken care of. It's still an extreme number of people, but for a lot of you, when you're looking at your budgets, there are situations where it may make sense for you. So keep it in mind when you're looking at your budget, would hiring people make my life easier, cheaper, break even, but more, more effective? Yeah, play around with it. Thanks for following. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, I'll put up the link up here. Buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott L. Miller. As always, share on social media. If you're looking for help with relocation, you want one-on-one -on -one assistance, uh, shoot us an email, info at relocatenicaragua.com, even if you just want to start looking for a house. And for everyone who is looking for a house, we just got to remind everyone, it takes months 
to look for a house reasonably. It is very difficult, and every time we go try to get a house showing, they turn us down. Once we've once we go through all the, they find out that we're perfect and we have money and there's the ability to rent a house. Then they expose that they were never going to show the house anyway, and it's not available for us to see. We have no idea why they do that, but it is extremely common and extremely frustrating. And I know some of you are getting frustrated with how long it takes to look at houses. This is how it works here, especially outside the tourist areas. They have no idea how to respond to people actually looking for the houses. Many of these have been on the market for years. And they're not taking it seriously, and they often have put it up thinking no one will ask, and it allows them to tell their family or whatever, oh, we're trying to make money. And then when someone actually shows up, they have to do something, and they may not actually want to rent it, and then they have to admit, we're not willing to show the house, and they're hoping we don't tell anyone. Uh, so that is a real thing. It takes a lot of work to be able to go look at houses, so just be aware. Just because we get a number and we call, even if we show up to an appointment, rarely do the people show up to show us the house. So uh, we're doing our best to get those, but that is a service we do. And, and that's why it's a service I think that's valuable because those things are really hard. If you're only here for a week and you have to spend that entire time rescheduling and rescheduling and try to cajole people to show you houses, it can be really hard. We're here, we, we can wait at home and do other things until they suddenly say, oh, you can look at a house now, we run and go look at it. Uh, so that's that's part of what we do. Share on social media, tell your friends about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow.